tonight or today we're going to be talking about the word Gentile and how the this word has been used to confuse people about what the Bible really is teaching. In a sense, what we're going to do is prove to you that the vast majority of instances of the word Gentile do not refer to non-Israelites, but do in fact refer to Israelites. And that's proven by the cross-references uh, from the verse under consideration to other verses where the, the same subject is spoken of Israelites, okay? And uh, David, let me just, I was thinking about this because we had a pre-show discussion. And I know uh, people hear me bash the King James trans translators all the time. However, I think in this case, what's going on is the King James translators did not understand they did not know about the ten lost tribes and that those tribes still exist. So they were assuming that the Jews were the only <laughs> only Israelites left, right? But uh, James 1.1 1, 1 starts out to the twelve tribes of Israel scattered abroad. Greetings. So uh, did they miss that verse? They had to understand that the twelve tribes still existed, but not in Judea. Uh, quick, uh, your comment on that real quick. <laughs> Well, yeah, thanks uh, for uh, having me on your show. Yeah, 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 we've already done this Gentiles uh, thing before, and now I've just uh, done a few more uh, videos and gotten more in-depth of it. So if you go to my angloisrael.com website and just scroll down, I've just added five new PDFs, plus there's five videos on my channel that coincide with my chart. So I'm just trying to make it a no-brainer. I mean, we've done this before, but, you know, I, I went more in-depth with it this time to make something that people could actually take. And once they learn it, I mean, you're going to have to read it a few times, but that's what I do. I'm not a pastor, but I just research all this stuff and try to put it together. People can understand it. But also, once you get it in your head, you can take something, you can take this and argue this Gentile versus Israel thing with any person, any pastor. It doesn't matter whether they got a degree or what. Once you get it down, there's just a few. There's really only about five verses. Once you get those tied together in your brain, then you will you can go back and forth and you can argue this to anybody. But I don't, I don't agree. I mean, I, I think you're right in some aspects. I mean, <clears throat> whether... Um, you know, the, it was the translators or somebody came after the publisher and decided to change things. Who knows how it came about? Frankly, it doesn't matter whether you use the term Gentiles. Once you can show people what Gentile means, it doesn't matter whether it uses Gentiles or not. It's right. the well, same thing I've argued with the, the Jays, you know. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's Israelite or Jew. Once you can argue, okay, here's where it connects and here's the definition in Scripture, it doesn't matter which term it uses. They can't change the context. And I don't agree. I think when they uh, put this New Testament together, they had to know about the, the house of Israel because, like you say, James, it's Peter, it's, it's all through. I mean, just, uh, you know, what we're going to argue today is Luke chapter 1, but, you know, it's the same thing. All right. Well, obviously the authors of the New Testament understood that the Israelites were scattered all over the Greco-Roman world, okay? You can't, you can't miss that. I mean, you know, no one can, no, especially someone that, you know, obviously they're a little more educated than just someone reading the Bible. Someone just reading the Bible can miss it. But, you know, someone translating the Bible, they can't miss that. They would have to do some, at least some recursory research as to whether these scattered tribes actually still exist, right? And there was the wow. British Israel movement, which was very strong in Britain, but I don't know if it started yet by, the t by 1611 when the King James Version was written. So the other, only other possibility uh, is, it, one, ignorance is what, what I'm arguing. Number two, deliberate obfuscation of the text, because everybody in the world believes that Gentiles are non-Israelites. Yeah, I think when they wrote the Bible, they wrote it one way, and then they, when it got published later on, it was changed. It's probably what really happened, but it doesn't matter. You just need to understand it so that when you go to t talk to somebody about it, you can show them why Gentiles have to be Israel, and we're going we're gonna to show that. That's very good. Very good. Okay. Anything else to, you want to say about the website, AngloIsrael.com? Well, yeah, actually, I, I did the website because what it was was uh, Bill Hollis. You know, uh, I, I you know I didn't even know the word Christian identity. When I met Bill Hollis, I mean, he basically had this message, but we didn't know that term. Uh, I was just putting it together because he wanted to put it on the web. 
So I bought the website and I just kind of did it for him. And then when he died, I just, you know, moved it over to its own little separate page. So if you go up there now, it's like I have a separate page for Bill Hollis. But, you know, the funny thing is he's got some really good, I get a lot of hits off that stuff. Webster and the term Jew. Oh, that's people, a, uh, oh, that's huge, and that's a good. That's really good. I mean, when you read it, that's a really good uh, background research on that term. Right. Well, yeah, he shows in that document that the Jews themselves don't consider themselves to be of Judah. <laughs> Nowhere, you know, because they asked twenty thousand Jewish families in Israel, "What what does the word Jew mean to you?" And none right. of them said, "Well, I'm a descendant of Judah." Not one. Yeah, and they, uh, go, he goes through all these references and all these different books and encyclopedias and just way back, each one, they shows that all these definitions are different. Yeah. There's no right. consistent definition throughout yeah. uh, over uh, 200 years of different looking at different books. The, yeah. the, they're all different. They found 13 different, absolutely different uh, definitions in books. All right. Yeah, it's it's incredible, but there has to be one correct definition of a word, and uh, we can even go back into Genesis twelve twelve one through three, where uh, you know they use the word uh, uh, Gentile and nation, and right. it's, those three verses they interchange Gentile with nation, but uh, the word Gentile in the Old Testament can only mean one thing, means nation, and you well, have to. And, and, and you can see it in some of the stuff I've covered. I, it's the exact same thing, just like you just said. He is Gentile one verse, and this is even in uh, Isaiah. And then a few verses over, it, it uses, it's talking about the exact same thing. It uses nations. Yeah. So it's positive. So right there in Isaiah. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. And so, okay, so Swamp Fox has put the, the link to your website into the chat room. So okay. people can go there and look at it while we while we're talking. Right, okay. Let me make one comment on that since okay. you're there. Uh, okay. You know, at the top, I've been talking a little bit about these viruses. You know, there's all these lies on on. You know, if you're watching TV, of course, it's all lies. At any rate, I saw I put some real information up there at the begin, top of my website, and I just moved it about viruses, how to kill Ebola, because we had this Dr. Rowan years ago that killed Ebola, and it was never reported on TV. Right. However, uh, so it just all kind of went away. They just quit reporting once people were cured of the Ebola. However, I've, uh, it's coming out now again, and he's just done a new video, and I've got that at the top of my website. And then all this research information he did about healing Ebola over in Sierra Leone years ago. So I just put it up there and well, showed this uh, ozone machine. It's getting an ozone machine and treating yourself with ozone and all that. So I just put all that at the top of my site. And then I left the second part up about this tour to Mount Sinai and this movie, The Red Sea Miracle. It's coming out February 18th. So if people and, want to see that, they need to get on the ball. Right. And that movie is about the fact that Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia, yeah. very much south of where the average theologian has been telling us it is. They've gotten that all wrong. And uh, now, uh, because the Saudi government has prevented people from investigating there, it was illegal and you could get shot. But now yeah. the Saudi government has opened it up. To yeah, and in fact, they're building a city there. They're building a city called Neom, which is 13 times the size of Manhattan. And oh. right now, this next week, is going to be the first group of people that are going there to the mountain. But there's already plenty of good video, and I've got links to all that. <laughs> Excuse okay, me. very good. So uh, all those listeners who want to know where the real Mount Sinai is and where the Israelites were, and, and there's an interesting element to the story, because I did watch the video a few times, where um, there's that verse in Joshua, wherever the soles of your feet touch, that's, that, that territory belongs to you Israelites, and you see imp impressions of feet. All right, let me point out one thing about that. Now, they did show all those impressions of feet all the way down to Yemen, and that, that's a point. However, when they made that comment, that's over in Deuteronomy. That's when they're going back into Israel, okay. uh, you know, in, into uh, Jericho. So that comment was made later as far as that verse. Okay. Yeah. However, if you just go back to Genesis 15, he also mentions at the end of uh, Genesis chapter 15 all the lands. And right. all those lands probably would include part of Saudi Arabia. So there's different ways to look at it. And I agree with the uh, drawings of the feet and all that. But, you know, the important thing is the, the real Mount Sinai, uh, basically, <clears throat> if you know where it is in the Sinai Peninsula, the fake one, 
it's due east across the Gulf of Aqaba on that mountain range over in, in Saudi Arabia. Okay. All right. So this this video clarifies all all this biblical terminology and the biblical places. It identifies the real places because, folks, the Bible is true history. It's not it's not fairy tales, as so many secularists will like like to argue. It is true history, and no one has ever proved it wrong. Well, the interesting thing is these videos, uh, these uh, they're coming out right now, are going to be in theaters in close to you. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And uh, he's already got two other DVDs. It's Tim Mahoney, but if you look at it, he's already got two other DVD movies. So he's doing a uh, a uh, proof, in other words, from here to here to here to here, connecting the dots, showing you that the path where they went through. Uh, where they came across all the evidence. It's because most, uh, you know, everything you read in Exodus is still there at Mount Sinai. You can go there today. It's yeah, just there. The, you know, the columns, the uh, the quarry. Uh, they, you know, they had a quarry there where they quarried those columns. It's all still there. And the top of Mount Sinai is burnt black because of oh, the presence. Everything. <laughs> everything. And there's water coming out of the mountain. And, and you look, you've got the burning bush, plus you've got fig trees, and you've got... Uh, in the middle of a desert. Yeah, fig trees in the middle of a desert. Yeah, which do not grow in that kind of climate. Yeah, and plus you've got the cedar uh, bush, the burning bush. It's still there. It's still there. It's all still there, folks. Yep. And uh, why has the world been deceiving us into believing in, in a different location? That's because, well, number one, the Jays don't want us to go there. They don't want us to verify the Bible. Well, because, you know, it, it was a claim from a long time ago. They, But, you know, you, at some point you just got to get off that and, and admit what's true. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into today's topic, which is a discussion of the word Gentile. And a basic point we want to make here today, folks, is that the word Gentile, wherever you see it, is almost always, almost 100% of the time, a reference to Israelites. It's almost never a reference to non-Israelites, as we've been falsely taught. The world has been teaching us that the Gentiles are non-Israelites, and there's a distinction between Israelites and Gentiles, and the fact there is not. The Bible, when you cross-reference the verses, you find out that these so-called Gentiles are actually Israelites. Okay, let's take us through it. Where do you want to start? Well, you know, we went over this before, and I've got a chart, so just go to my uh, Anglo-Israel site and scroll down. There's two charts. for If you want to understand context, so this is all about context. What you want to do is uh, you go to a section, uh, you read the verses before and after. I mean, if you want to understand what it's saying, you got to look before and see what, you know, like Acts 13, 47 uses the term Gentiles. Everybody knows that. So you got to start with Acts chapter 13 and just, you know, I mean, you can't just read a verse and then say, okay, well, this means this or this means that. you got to go look it up, put it in context. So I made two. Here's what I did. I put the Old Testament quotes in order. Now, there's an Old Testament order, in other words, Genesis to Malachi. Then there's a New Testament order from the first mention of uh, Gentiles, in other words, in okay. Matthew to the last one, which is in Peter. Uh, okay. I think it's 315, 1 Peter 3.15, I think is the last okay. one. So you got you to gotta look it through uh, this stuff in order. And then when you get these charts, they're PDF, you can download them. And you need both of them because when you're in the Old Testament, if you want to know what the the uh, Isaiah, and this is really about Isaiah today, but what you want to do is just start, okay, what's the first quote to Isaiah? Well, it's Romans 9.29, and that quotes okay. Isaiah 1.9. All right, so you want to start at the beginning of Isaiah. It's handy, if you're reading Isaiah, to know that, hey, there's a quote that comes back to Isaiah 1.9 from Romans 9.29. And, of course, we all know Romans chapter 9 about the potter over the clay, right? Right. And you've taught that before. So if you're over here in Isaiah, the Isaiah puts the New Testament order, and then what it says over here in the New Testament puts Isaiah in, in proper context for you, you see. So you you have to know these connections, and then on top of that, you're going to use cross-references and look and okay, say, okay, what else connects, you see. Yeah. And that's how you understand what Isaiah is talking about, because most people are teaching Isaiah wrong, right. and they they uh, just do not even take quotes into context or cross-references, either one. And so that's what I'm doing in my charts. When I, okay. you pull down these uh, PDFs, that's what I'm doing, connecting the dots, 
showing the quotes and cross references if they're uh, if they're okay. important, you know. All right, so I'm looking right now in my eSword, Romans 9.29 and 9.30, and both of those verses use uh, the word Gentiles. Interestingly, right. in my an annotated version here, it's t the subject is Israel's unbelief, which indicates that the word that the, Paul is talking to and about Israelites, not about Gentiles, right? So oh, yeah. they understand that he, Paul is talking about Israelites, Yet they use the word Gentiles when they should be using nations or Israelites or brethren. Even that right. would be. So here, let me quote it. Romans 9.29. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabbath had left us a seed, and we had a congregation, the Peshitta translates it as posterity, except Yahweh of the Sa Lord of the Sabbath had left us a posterity, we had been as Sodoma or Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. So he's saying, okay, there is a posterity, a remnant, a people of, of all 12 tribes still around. That's what, right. that's what Paul is saying, okay? So uh, take us back to um, Isaiah and uh, l let's see what that verse is about. All right, well, I've got this chart pulled up. So New Testament quotes in order. So if you're over here in Romans, you go over here to chapter 9, and then you you look before and after and see what else in Romans, in other words, connects to what verse, and then you go and read all that stuff. Well, if you're here at 929, you'll notice that really this whole conversation here from 925 to 933, there's five quotes here. Right. And all these quotes connect back and forth to each other. And they're about, they're really in time context. So in the New Testament uh, chart, I uh, these are basically, and I, you know, we talked about this before. What I wrote on here is I, I put all this into context, and I just wrote a one sentence uh, compilation of what is supposed to be talking about. It doesn't necessarily apply to that specific verse, but it applies to the context, the context. in general. Context. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So for 929, I've got remnant of 12 tribes saved at the end time during the tribulation period and find mercy for following God's law. That's what it says. But then you notice in 33, it's going to Isaiah 28, 16 about the Jews against Christ falling over Christ the stumbling stone. Right. And then I've got the cross reference, which is another okay. quote to right. Isaiah. You know, it's interesting because a lot of identity people automatically assume that when Yahshua criticizes uh, the people that he's talking to, that they're automatically Edomites. And that's not the case. Very often, in fact, in fact the whole book of Romans, in my opinion, is Paul chastising unbelieving Judahites, wherever they may be, right? Well, absolutely, because you can put it in that context by using this chart. So that's why I right. highlight, well... You can see the highlights again. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Okay, so Exodus, uh, as part of this scenario here, uh, Exodus thirty three nineteen, God will have mercy on whomever he chooses to. And Paul says, okay, well, uh, Yahweh decided he doesn't want to give mercy to Edomites. Okay, <laughs> so he says, God will have mercy on whoever he chooses. Who are you, who are you to argue with God? Well, I think, uh, you know, I don't I don't necessarily agree with that context as far as he's speaking to Edomites. He, he uses that idea. Right. I think the reason he uses this uh, quote back to uh, uh, Jacob versus, uh, you know, Edom, yeah. Esau, is because, uh, you know, what he's pointing out is, look, he chose, if you recall, Rebecca had a prophecy that mm -hmm. the the uh, Jacob would be chosen. In other words, and she understood that, which is why at the end she got Jacob to go in there, and basically they say, well, Jacob stole his uh, blessing yeah, or whatever. But that's not what happened. What happened was before they were born, she inquired of Yehoah, you know, what's going on? You know, they're fighting in my womb or whatever. Why am I like this? And he says, well, because the uh, elders gonna, you know, be the one that he's chosen. In other words. <laughs> Yeah, right. you, can go, you can go over here. But at any rate, exactly. so it was a prophecy. So it wasn't, she didn't, you know, Sarah didn't do something, or, or Rebecca. Rebecca. Rebecca right. didn't do something that was, uh, okay. You know, uh, so this whole scenario was ordained by Yahweh. That's what you're saying. It's a prophecy. So don't it's blame a prophecy me. being fulfilled. So when she told him to do that, she knew the prophecy. And I'm sure she had already told, you know, 
and Isaac was hungry and side <laughs> sidetracked. He, she was she knew the prophecy better than he did, right? Because it was delivered directly to her. Yeah, and I'm sure she told him. But the point is, she yeah. just made sure that the prophecy came through because she 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 had been been told. I mean, you know, right? right. Okay, all right. So nine uh, Romans nine twenty five. Okay, so the house of Israel, house of Judah, brought back together under Christ. Uh, where so the what's uh, where's the word Gentile? It's it's used in Romans nine twenty five. Well, it uses Jew and Gentile uh, down there. And I'd like to say, if you just look at these together and then look up the quotes, you can kind of put this in context. But the Jews and Gentiles are right here at 925 and 927. And that goes to Hosea. So when you go over there, you, you can see the context in Hosea 1, 9 and 10 and Hosea 2, 23 are yeah. absolutely about all 12 tribes coming together at the end time, which is a repeated prophecy from Jeremiah and other places. But okay. the point is, you go back there and look, and now it's just talking about 12 tribes, not talking about Gentiles. Right. Okay, so let me quote Romans 9.25 for those who don't have a Bible open. As he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. What's he talking about? Is it He's talking about the scattered lost tribes, is he not? Right, right. Yeah. He's talking about all 12 of them come together, which is the context of what you're reading, you know, right. in the New Testament. You know, he, he's, the first thing he did, he told them, and what was it, Matthew 10:5 uh, to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and right. basically take them the kingdom message. So he just basically told them, look, go to your brethren, tell them this message, that they're being redeemed, which is what happened when he died. Right. Okay, excellent, excellent. All right, so uh, I think uh, that's pretty clear. When you see the word Gentile in the New Testament, always check cross reference. Always check the cross reference to find out who's being talked about in the Old Testament or in other verses in the New Testament, because cause sometimes they have it correct and they will say either nations or Israelites instead of Gentiles. Yeah, okay. and the other thing is sometimes, you know, we all know that stuff is repeated in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it might say something in Matthew, but every, you go over in Luke, and all of a sudden in Luke, it, it explains it, you know, where it's not explained exactly. in Matthew or it's not yeah. explained in Mark, but it is in Luke. And that's what people miss a lot of times. Yes. Yeah. Well, see, so that's why I've got this chart tied together the way it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what we've been doing here at Eurofolk Radio for the most part, we have been doing word studies to show – what the words really mean in the original languages because they've been so badly translated and Gentile is a perfect example that you cannot understand the Bible unless you go back to the original language and find out what the authors really intended to say because never is Paul talking about non-Israelites or two non-Israelites. He's always, even the Galatians, okay, which most people assume are quote-unquote Gentiles, that is, non-Israelites. No, they were Gauls. They were part of the scattered tribe of Israel that settled in Gaul, and they had come back to, to the Levant and settled in Galatia. These people were Israelites, and Paul knew they were Israelites. Okay, where do you want to go next? Well, now here, uh, since we're still on the New Testament chart, I just went back to Matthew uh, 4.15. Which okay. goes to Isaiah 9 2. Christ is a light to the 12 tribes in the end time. And I think it's end time, and I kind of get through that. And then you can see the cross reference is Luke 168 through 79. That's what I put on here. So okay. you need to know because we're going to go to Luke. However, so if you go back to Isaiah 9 2 then and go back there and look, you now you switch back to the Old Testament quotes in order and go back to Isaiah. So if you want to understand what 9-2, the context of Isaiah 9-2, what would you do? Well, you probably yeah. want to start with the beginning of Isaiah and, and try to figure out what the context, what's it talking about in that section of Isaiah. Well, when you go back here and look at the chart, you'll notice all these quotes that come back to Isaiah from Romans 9-29 was the first one. But then right. you go to the next one is Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. And you see that there's four different verses in the New Testament that quote Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. And right. uh, really, I wrote the context. is the uh, It's Israelites who are against Christ and Israelites that are for Christ. That's kind of the way I put it. 
So right. this starts at the very beginning back at Sinai. This whole concept started from the very beginning. The reason they went 40 years in the desert, now this is important to think about. They had already come out. They came across the, the Red Sea. They're over here at Mount Sinai. Christ is basically it's Yahweh speaking to them at the mountain. They tell Moses, look, you, you talk to them. We don't want to hear, you know, we've heard it up. You, you just go talk to them. So the thing is, they had witnessed most of the miracles in the Bible are actually this part coming out of Egypt and what happened going across the Red Sea and then what happens at Mount Sinai. There's all kinds of things happen at Mount Sinai. Most people never even think about all this stuff, but there's a lot of stuff that's going on there. Yeah, right. I, I, I laugh because, you know, I'm kind of into essential oils and people miss this. But if you look at Exodus chapter 13, they had an apothecary. And when you realize they were standing in front of Mount Sinai, you know, you look at these videos on Mount Sinai and you're like, it's all just rocks and desert. Right. Okay. How do you create an apothecary and it says they were distilling uh, frankincense, myrrh, and gold. It's gold oil, which is okay. actually cannabis oil. Okay. At any rate, uh, people, uh, the context is essential to this. All right. That's what they brought to Christ. Yeah. Right. Gold yeah. oil, not gold bars, gold and oil. It's supposed to make the showbread also. Okay. And, yeah. And so here's, here it is right there. Exodus chapter 30. They mentioned an apothecary twice. And uh -huh. then later on, you can see they were spinning the, uh, they used the royal uh, blue uh, yarn and all this kind of stuff. And they were doing all this in front of the mountains. They were there uh, for uh, almost two years. At any rate, okay. they're doing all this right there. And you, you look at the videos and they're like, okay, well, where are they getting their water from? Because they're in the desert and it doesn't rain there. Exactly. And uh, you, know, you got this water coming down the side of the mountain and you, you can see all that. But you think, okay, so how do you do an apothecary? How do you, how do you distill frankincense in front of Mount Sinai? Right. Yeah, any idea what that takes? You're like, okay, how do they do this? How do they do that? How do they make this stuff well, that's talked yeah. about? How do they do all that? Something. Yeah, they had the spring. Now look at the video. Look at where they're at. Okay, they're out in the middle of the desert, 100 plus degree heat. How do they do all this stuff? Well, no one can really answer that because it doesn't make sense. And the first thing is this: uh, these oils, frankincense, actually only comes out of Oman and. Somalia. That's the only two places on earth you can get it. So how'd they get the oil from way down there up to Mount Sinai? You know, I'm just saying people don't consider all this stuff. Right. So you got to think about all that. Right. Yeah. Moses so, sent out a group of uh, apothecaries to get it, right? Well, but here, I mean, it's there in scripture, but people read past that and they don't think right. about the concept of how much is actually going on at Mount Sinai until you read it again. And you think, oh, okay, well, they did all this stuff. They built the tabernacle. They did this, they did that. And the other thing they miss, and I've highlighted this, is by, it tells you that Moses wrote two books. He wrote a book of the wars, and then he wrote a book, a book of the law. It wasn't just that it was on tablets. Yes, it was on tablets written by the finger of God. Okay. And then, actually, that's where the Hebrew language started. So I gave you some videos on that, the writing of God. It's a whole channel on YouTube by okay. uh, PhD in language. Uh, at any rate, I've got all that in these videos, so you can just look through the, my links. I gave you links to the channels and I, everything. But here, getting back to context. So you look at Isaiah 6, 9, and 10 on my chart, and you see there's four verses quoted. And then, so everything in this context, here was what I was saying before. Mass, it's Matthew 13, 14, Luke 8, 10, John 12, 40, and Acts 28, 27. Those four verses in the New Testament also cross-reference to each other. Mm -hmm. So the same context as one is in another. And it's all about uh, basically one side of Israel fighting the other side of Israel. And that concept started at Mount Sinai when some of them rejected uh, Jehovah. In other words, they saw all these miracles, but they rejected it. And it says, Christ himself says, you, you worship Moloch in the desert. Right. Now, that's when they were sent into the captivity. So here's what they missed. They were given this uh, back in uh, Genesis 15, 13. This was Jehovah or Christ the shield in Genesis 15, 1. We're going to talk about that next. And then he gave a prophecy to Abraham that he'd bring his children out of Egypt. 
And right. then that's, uh, it was st in Stephen's defense in Acts chapter 7. And if you look at Acts chapter 7, you see that refers, that quotes, actually, uh, Genesis 12, 1, which you were talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. That ties right. it all together. But who's speaking in Genesis 15, 1, the shield, and that's Yehoah, the same entity that's at the mountain that gave Abraham that prophecy in Genesis 15, 13, that he was going to bring him out. So what Paul said then about that in Galatians 3.16 is that Christ was promised first, and then the law came 430 years later. Right, right, exactly. And that, that's a cross-reference to the first verse of the New Testament. And I always hit pastors with that because they do not know how to prove that what Paul said is correct. Christ was promised first, yes. then the law came. And if you look that up, it quotes back to, uh, I, th I think it actually quotes uh, Exodus, but then what it quotes in Exodus goes back to Genesis 15, 13. He's yeah. talking about that prophecy. Yeah. And so if Christ was promised before that prophecy, then where was Christ promised to Abraham? If Paul's correct, you see. Well, the prophecy is 15, 13, so it had to be before Genesis 15, 13, which I've proved uh, pretty much beyond a doubt that Genesis 15, 1 is Christ, because okay. Christ is called the rock, the shield, and he's the scepter of Judah, all right there in Genesis. Okay, very good, very good. Yeah, and this is very important because the vast majority of Christ, Judeo-Christian theologians falsely interpret Paul in Romans chapter 3 and other places where he's talking about all he's saying is that Christ was promised, the, rede the Redeemer was promised before the law of Moses was given. Okay? Now, it wasn't, it, that, it wasn't that Abraham was not following God's law, but he absolutely was. It tells you in Genesis 26, 5, right? they followed all the statutes, the commandments, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, the reason Abraham was chosen was because he did what Yehovah told him to do. When Yehovah told him to sacrifice his son, he did it. I mean, That's the right. thing was... Put, he, was, he put him up there. He was ready to stab him and kill him, at, and he stopped him right at that moment. But he said he saw his heart, and he was willing to sacrifice his son, which was what he was waiting on. And when he was willing to follow what Christ told him to do, that's when the covenant became uh, right, un right. was conditional up to that point. In other words, it was conditional that, right. that, that Abraham would do what he told him to do. Once he saw that he was willing to sacrifice his son, which, which he told him to do, then the covenant became unconditional from that point okay. forward. Okay. Then yeah. it's when all those prophecies, the, all the things that he had told them from the beginning is when all that became unconditional. And then from there on, everything that's happened, he did it. Christ yes. did it. We didn't right. do anything. Christ it's, was helping us. That's it's, what it's, power it's, with God came from. It's <laughs> amazing how few Judeo-Christian theologians understand this because they falsely interpret Paul as suggesting the law has been done away with. No, he's not saying that at all. He's saying that the, uh, that the, the Redeemer was promised to Israel before the Mosaic law was codified, and therefore yeah. redemption has nothing to do with Moses. Yeah, the law That's existed. Crazy. Abraham was following it, but it actually was written by the finger of God on those tablets, which, of course, right. Moses broke set, but then he made it another set. It was written down, and that's what this uh, PhD, Dr. Miles Jones, has pointed out. That's where the language of Hebrew was actually first, the first written language was given at Mount Sinai, and he's made that point beyond a doubt, I think. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, so at the very least, Moses, in writing the Torah, uh, basically uh, standardized for lack of a better word, standardized Hebrew, whatever language they were speaking with each other before then, and maybe Job was written before the Torah. I don't, I'm not sure. Well, Some they might have been speaking Hebrew. It just was not written. It wasn't a written language. They were using a pic pictograph or whatever they call it before right. that, but it was actually yeah. written originally yeah. when uh, Yehoah wrote it in stone. That's where Moses then, after that, wrote this book of the law, yeah. and then he wrote a book of the war. So he wrote two books at so Mount Sinai. We don't have that, don't have that second book yet. That, that's that no longer well, exists we have it in, in the Bible and in, in any way you want to look at it, the wars are there. You know, they're in uh, Deuteronomy and so forth. So there we have it. But uh, okay. the point was that he wrote that at Mount Sinai. 
Okay, very good. Uh, the one other verses I want to cover real quickly here is 1 Corinthians 10.1. And moreover, brethren, uh, brethren is a delphos, means, meaning those who come from the same womb. And we're talking about Sarah here. So Abraham's uh, wife, Sarah, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, Jacob's wives. This is because these are the brethren, the posterity. The posterity of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is what we're talking about here. I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all of our fathers, our forefathers, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. So, this can't, who's he talking about here, David? Well, Ooh. I just flipped over to my New Testament quotes and orders chart and went over to 1 Corinthians. And then if you just look there, of course, you can see it's about Israel because right. you have a quote before it and you have a quote after it. And it's all about Israel there on my chart. So, so. anytime you want to look at a, a, a part of the, the, especially the New Testament, you look at, see where it quotes and then go back there and look at that. So, so. I have uh, ten seven is quoting Exodus 32.6. And that's where uh, 23,000 died for the sin of fornication at Mount Sinai, which is kind of uh -huh. apropos. <laughs> right, sure. Yeah, yeah and, uh, 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 the guy that Phineas killed. <laughs> Maybe, is he yeah. counted that? <laughs> no, that's that's right. later. But this was, uh, right. I think that was over the gold. Was that the golden calf or was that before right. that? I think that was before the golden yeah. calf. But now, interestingly, in the New Testament, Paul talks about 20,000 uh, being uh, there, uh, uh, saints that uh, appeared on behalf of Elijah, okay? But he actually, uh, so the, these 23,000, oh yeah, and there were 23,000, uh, uh, I believe, uh, disciples in the New Testament mentioned. So in, in other words, those who were killed in the Old Testament reappeared in the New Testament, at least the numbers, the numbers. Yeah. So, okay, so where do you want to go next uh, on your chart? Well, you know, that's kind of a good point, but let's uh, let's miss that for time being. All right, so go yeah. back over to Isaiah. We're on Isaiah uh, 6, 9, and 10. I just pointed out there's a whole bunch of verses here, but this is, pro this is another important thing that people miss here is this Christ the stumbling stone. The biggest okay. thing that's quoted in the New Testament is in the Old Testament is actually about Israelites that stumble over this message of Christ. And they call it the stumbling mm -hmm. stone. But that's why Christ is called the stone, the rock, and that kind of thing. It's because, you know, they uh, have a huge part, and it started uh, right there at Mount Sinai, a huge part of Israel people stumble over the message. Now, why did they go into the 40 years? And they went through, of course, Arabia, and I pointed that out. Uh, the quote was, go by the way of the Red Sea. Now, when this happened, they had just gone out to spy out the land. And who was sent to spy out the land? Who did Moses send? He sent the heads of all the 12 tribes. And it even puts their names in there in Exodus, who they were. They mm -hmm. were sent up. They spied out the land. So they went north from Mount Sinai. Think about this. And think about this. If they're in Arabia and where Sinai is supposed to be, and yes. where we accept it today as being, if that's where they were, they went north, so they went up the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba, then they went across, went on up to Israel, spied out the land, they came back down south, then went over on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba, then came back down to Mount Sinai. Now, uh, they gave a bad report. And then the next thing you see is that Christ rejects them. He says, they've sinned these 10 times, go by the way of the Red Sea okay. into the desert. That's what the command is. Now, right. if they just went north, so basically they're kind of at the bottom of the Gulf of Aqaba on the east side. They went north. Now they just came back to Mount Sinai. Right. He would not tell them to go by the way of Red Sea, go back north, because if they did that, they would just be going right back to Israel. Right. Yeah. Right. They, they, they didn't get lost. They, they just don't. came That's, from there. Yeah. Right. There's no way to get lost for 40 years on a path that you just came down. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it makes no sense. It makes yeah. zero sense. However, if going by the way of the Red Sea meant go south, and the Red right. Sea, the the main body of the Red Sea starts right there when they go south. That's right. when it gets really big because the Gulf right. of Aqaba is pretty small if you look on your map. However, the Red Sea is huge. Right. So 
if they went south, then they went down the west coast of, of Arabia, all the way down to Yemen, and that's where those footprints you were talking about. They've got right. drawings on rocks all the way down to Yemen of footprints okay. of children that they've scribed into stone. Okay, so approximately where is the crossing point of the Israelites from uh, from Egypt over to Arabia. Yeah, it's Nueva, and that that's what you'll see in this Red Sea miracle in this movie. And, and you can see all that. It's already on the web. I've got the links in my PDFs of all those channels with all the video. So it's all well explained. And there's a book there, and there's, uh, Glenn Fretz has a PhD. He's wrote a book that details this in great detail, and you can buy his book as well. So. Yeah, and that area is much shallower than the rest of the funny thing is, north and south. The Gulf of, Ac uh, of Aqaba is very deep, except in that one spot where they came across from Nueva. And the other thing about that is, if you're on the Egyptian side, when you get up to the sea, uh, all of a sudden it gets hard. It's sand, but it gets hard. So what happened was, that's where the uh, tornado of fire went down a part of the sea, and it went down, and it just fused all that sand, and so it only goes down about 30 feet right there, something like that, but that's where it's fused underneath, so, yeah. and they haven't, uh, a lot, there hasn't been a lot of exploration there, but there's been some, so, uh, we also, there's a video, I don't think I linked to it, but if you look good enough, you'll find there's some uh, video from the Arabia side, from the Saudi side, because before there'd only been people diving from the Egyptian side, but they also went down on the Arabian side as well. Okay. So you can see all this stuff underneath the water there that looks like chariot wheels and parts and pieces and all that. So exactly. all that's detailed, yeah. Yeah, and isn't there a stele on the Arabian side um, uh, dedicating a monument to the Red There's Sea? There's a stone brown stone, but it's on the Egyptian side. There was one on the Arabian side, and they took it down. So they have it, their uh, Department of Antiquities, or whatever they call that in Arabia. They have the, the column. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so there's so much proof that uh, that these are historical events. They can't be denied, but this information has been withheld from the general public, and consequently, secularists say, oh, the Bible is nothing but fairy tales. No, it isn't. This is all uh, history documented, period. Okay, back to you. Well, that's, that's the important point, is if you don't know where Sinai is, then it's a fable. And right. the problem with the fake one is none of the things you read in the Exodus are at the fake Sinai. So right. that's right. why even, even uh, Jews have said, well, you know, it didn't happen. A lot of your scholars have said, oh, it's a fairy tale, because if you go over to the one in Egypt, none of that stuff, and, and you can't yeah. substantiate that's the mountain. None of the things it's that are supposed to be right. there are there. Now, there right. is an argument. Here's an argument that you probably don't know about. Uh I forget, I, maybe it was uh, David Roll or whoever, he's a PhD. But at any rate, he says, well, uh, okay, so when they came uh, out, supposedly they only traveled three days into the desert and were given three places where apparently they stopped overnight. In three days, uh, if you look at the map, well, that trip from where they were up in Goshen over to Nueva Beach, right. that's somewhere around 200 miles or more. Okay. You can't do that in three days. No. Typically, uh, they might not, not go more than six miles a day, typically, and you can possibly go 20 miles a day or something like that, but you can't go 200 miles. Yeah, yeah. You have to. You can't go any faster than the slowest person. <laughs> right. Okay. However, yeah. it doesn't say for sure that they, that it only took them three days to go all the way to Mount Sinai. It doesn't say that. Right. And so this is an assumption based on the fact that it says they went three days into the wilderness. If all that, if that's all you're taking into account then yeah, there's no way they could go that far. But if you look, if you read it again, it, it, I don't think it really says that. I mean, it says different things in different places, and they're just looking at that one part, and I agree. However, it, somewhere else, and I forget where, if it's in Daniel, it says he brought them out on eagles' wings. Right. And uh, you recall they had a fire during the day and a uh, cloud by, uh, I mean, a fire at night and a cloud by day. So... Uh, they were yeah, walking at night, it. so they're walking 24 hours is the way it makes it sound, which that also doesn't sound like something you could do either. Yeah. However, 
you know, we're talking about miracles here. There's no telling if it was really three days. I don't see that from reading well, the text myself. Well, maybe I, I should say it was three days, days before they stopped the rest. You know, yeah. uh, to, uh, if people can force march of you know, refugees, all right, they do that all the time, right? Just, so it's, it, it, it doesn't matter because it still wouldn't add up to 200 miles. What I'm saying is I don't see that it only says they went three days from the time they left to the time they got it signed. In fact, in another place, it, said, it looks like it's 30 days, not three days. I think right. they're wrong about the three days. I think the three days was when they first came out of Goshen into the Sinai Peninsula area, and then from there, they kept going. Right. That, that right. sounds uh, more logical. Right. Okay. So where do you want to go next? All right, so we're back here on my Old Testament and uh, quotes and order chart. Now, <clears throat> the reason you need to look through this is because if you were wanting to, to look at the context then, uh, Matthew 4.16 or 4.15 about Gentiles. This is the first use of Gentiles. Okay. The light coming to Israel. Well, you just go back here to Isaiah and you look and you see these quotes. You got 7.14 is about Christ, Emmanuel, right? That comes from Matthew 1.23. So you'd be like, oh, okay, so why does this pop up in 7 and 14? Now, that's kind of an odd thing when you read it. He's okay. talking to uh, the king or something like that, and just in the middle of his conversation, he brings up this, the child's going to be born, you know, of course, right. which is in Matthew. Yeah, and why would he even say that? And, of course, I don't think he even knew what he was saying, because if you read it, it's like, well, in the middle of a conversation, he just changes context, and he gives you a prophecy about Christ being born. That's just, you know, when you're reading it, it doesn't make any sense. But at any rate, and then you would go on, and you'd say, well, in 8.12 and 18, here's two more quotes, and in 8.14, here's another quote. Well, wait a minute. 8.14 is an important quote because 8.14 goes to 1 Peter 2.8 about Christ the stumbling stone. And this right. is really what ties it all together is 1 Peter chapter 2 because it, it teaches uh, Christ the stumbling stone. And if you look at those quotes, well, one comes to Isaiah. And then if you look down below, oh, you see another Christ the stumbling stone in Isaiah 28.16. Right. That's right. quoted from Romans 9.33, where, where, where we started. Right. Okay. All right. The important, all consider, yeah, the important consideration here is that Christ is the stumbling stone for Israel. Right. Okay. For the non-believing Israelites, that's what he's the stumbling stone for. <laughs> well, the point is some of them uh, rejected Christ. That's right. right. At Mount Sinai, they were killed. So, in other words, they re – and I, I was – trying to explain that they rejected a prophecy about them from Genesis 15, 13. They were prophesied to be brought out. They came out, and then they rejected Christ. Right. Oh, yeah, I am. I, it's, I right. am. Right. Mm -hmm. the, they rejected the very – but this was also taking place in the, the days of Paul because when Paul – first of all, he had the confrontation with Peter – because Peter didn't understand that the so-called Gentiles were the Israelites of the dispersion, right? Paul had to clarify that to Peter before he finally understood. You know, that, that's the part where he has the vision. Well, Peter even went better with it and tied it all together by taking it back to this uh, Christ the Stumbling Stone, which comes right back here to Isaiah 8.14, and then it's again in 28.16 and 29.13. Then when you look down at these quotes, you'll notice, well, this quotes all kinds of stuff. Quotes right. Romans, First Corinthians, where you were just were, quotes Matthew, Mark, Romans, twice, first in First Corinthians twice, and First Peter ties it all together right there. And you just got to realize that all of these are in the same context. So when you go look up all these verses, they all connect. So whatever's there in Romans 9.33 connects to First Corinthians 14.24, which connects to First Peter 2.6. All that's connected. Yeah. yeah. And so when Paul confronts the house of Judah in Rome, he tells them, well, you have the law. And the issue with the with these Judahites, they're not they're not Jews in the sense that they're Edomite Jews. These were Judahites. They were ritualistic. You know, they, they were still slaughtering lambs because they did not accept the Messiah had come. In fact, they heard, were just finding out about this. And Paul went up there to explain to them, hey, the Messiah had come. You don't need to practice these ritual sacrifices anymore. 
that's what yeah we're... however when you look at uh, other things that paul says to you know it does say that they knew well uh, for stephen in other words they knew they had been given the law by the angels agency of angels but they never followed it that's right. what he told them they they right. knew about the law but they didn't follow the law they used the law it's the same thing look it's the exact same thing you got today the leaders of your country you know are, are in authority over applying the law they apply it to you but they they themselves do not right. follow. They're exempt. Right. Exactly. The exact same thing to a T at the point in time there. They knew all about the law, but none of them followed it, but they applied it to you. So if you violated the law, then you had to bring your sacrifice and your offering or whatever. They could violate the law all they want, and they just hit it. They all covered the, the uh, yeah, yeah, it's the same it's, thing you got going in Hollywood. That's why Hollywood's so degenerate. They are all just covering up like Weinstein right. and all these people. Same thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. The authorities t tend to be corrupt, <laughs> right? And uh, then Paul—that's why Paul tells them, "Don't be proud. You're too proud, and uh, you're, but you're hypocrites." Yes, you're but he didn't call them someone other than Israel. In fact, that's what right. they do is they t absolutely tell you they're Israelites, but they tie it back to Sinai. So if you look at what Stephen says. They tie it back to the beginning, and that's where Christ's stumbling stone starts. In other words, he starts right there at Sinai from these people who saw all these miracles, but they rejected the Spirit of Christ at okay. Sinai. Then they were, they were killed. They were sent into the desert for 40 years to be killed, he, but he saved their sons. Now, in right. Stephen's defense, he's talking to those sons, the posterity of their fathers. He absolutely says their forefathers. So he's right. coming back here to Sinai. He ties it back to Egypt, coming out of Egypt. So he absolutely ties it right back to Sinai. So they they're right. the sons of their forefathers who rejected Christ at Sinai. That's the point in the New Testament. Right. Okay. So where uh, where is the passage on Stephen? It's got to be in Acts, right? It's Acts where chapter is, seven. You just read that whole chapter. Yeah. Acts chapter seven. Well, let's go there because this is a this is important stuff. So Acts chapter seven, and uh, we know in the book of Acts uh, th that's where Paul confronts Peter about the the, the lost tribes, the scattered tribes, and says that. Uh, well, well, and keep in mind that Acts chapter seven and what Paul says and. Uh, Acts 13 are almost the same kind of conversation because okay. what Paul says, he ties it back to, uh, you know, men, he starts out men of Israel. And he, so he ties it all the way back to Abraham. And okay. Stephen kind of does the same thing in chapter 7, ties it back to Sinai. So Okay, so what verse is uh, spe uh, Stephen speaking here? So in Acts chapter 7, I would just kind of start at the beginning, but okay. uh, Stephen's defense is the beginning of 7. And uh, you notice uh, he's in front of, well, mine says the Senate or the Council in the verse before right. chapter okay. 7. Right. And it's the high priest. He says, the God of majesty appeared to our forefather, Abraham. That's how it starts out. Our well, forefather. The God of majesty. He's talking about Jehovah, who met them at Mount Sinai. And he's saying that applied to our forefather, Abraham. So he's saying that this Jehovah at Mount Sinai appeared to Abraham. Okay, mm -hmm. that's Genesis 15.1. That's Christ the shield. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Before he settled in, no, he's talking about Abraham before he got uh, to uh where he was actually if you read uh that yeah. video abraham at uh sinai uh that i mentioned before uh miles jones the writing of god he's got a video abraham at sinai and he shows you that abraham actually came through mount sinai on uh, his trip yeah okay. yeah very that's good. very important very read that okay well so, here let me just make a, let me make a quick from your here. relatives and then he quotes genesis 12 1 so Okay. All right. Uh, let me just make a quick point about Acts 7-2, that uh, he calls these people his brethren. There's nobody else in the whole world who would have known what he was talking about except Israelites. Okay? Yeah. Because only, only Israelites came out under the cloud, you know, the cloud of Moses, right? Well, okay. And, and he's talking about, you know, uh, kindred people from, of course, uh, in kindred. Right. Starts right there in Genesis 12, 1, which is what he's quoting, Genesis 12, 1. And then he quotes Genesis 15, 13, and then Exodus 3, 12. So, right. so he gives this whole thing beginning right there from Genesis 12, 1, and then goes forward with it, tying it all together. 
racial lodge in a, in a foreign country, and they will enslave and oppress it for 400 years. Well, that's the quote right. from Genesis 15, 13. Right. <clears throat> and, yeah. As yeah. Paul says in Galatians 3, 16, about the law coming 430 years later. Same thing. Right. Okay. And these called New Testament Christians <clears throat> don't understand that virtually all of this discussion is about the Old Testament and them being the descendants of the, the posterity of these people, Israel. Uh, That's verse what the seven is all about. Come, Back to you, yeah, okay, in this place. So when this place that he's talking about in verse uh, seven and eight, there is Mount Sinai. Okay, right. so they came out to worship him, but then some of them rejected him. And if you look at who it was that, that, that was sent into the desert for 40 years that rejected him, they were the leaders of these 12 tribes, uh, excluding uh, Caleb and uh, and Joshua. Right. <clears throat> right. Yeah. And uh, Caleb yes. and Joshua made it through the 40 years, right? You notice. The only ones. But the rest of them died. Right. Even Moses. Moses so they died it, uh, not embracing this prophecy. Right. They died. They were given this prophecy, Genesis 1513, which okay. is right there, and then now, they died. Now, isn't there something similar going on in the New Testament? Because Paul excoriates the uh, the Romans, the Roman Judahites, and the, the Galatians, and others by saying, unless you have faith in Christ, unless you have faith in the Redeemer, unless you accept the sacrifice he made for you at Calvary, then you're not a real Israelite. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. All right? Well, and there it says it right here, too, in, in 7, 8. He talks about uh, game of the covenant, Isaac being born, circumcised him, uh -huh. then Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob, the 12 patriarchs, or 12 tribes, right there. Yeah, right. So it's all a reference back. So all these people who call themselves New Testament Christians, there's no way they can understand the New Testament without all these cross-references back to the Old Testament. There's simply no way. No, pastors okay. simply change the context. They don't teach the, the quotes. They don't teach the cross-references. And if they do, they ignore the racial part of it and just teach. And that's what you call doctrine. That's why Judeo-Christianity is simply a doctrine. It's not teaching what Christ taught. Christ right. taught the covenant. They just teach doctrine, and then they make it up. And that's why there's 30,000. You can never make the doc. Any made-up doctrine cannot be correct. That's right. why you have so many different ones. Well, one guy says it's this way. Another one says it's that way because it, none of it's correct. <clears throat> they can't make it correct because it only be correct when you teach the covenant. That's right. <clears throat> that ties all this stuff together. Okay, so and the point I want to stress here, the, the stumbling stone is not – just Edomites. It doesn't even apply to Edomites because... It only applies to the Israelites because right. it's applying to people who knew Yehoah from Mount Sinai and they knew these prophecies. That's the whole point. When they came out of Egypt, they knew that was a prophecy because right. Moses went from the burning bush, sent him over there, and then he was told to come back to the burning bush. Think right. about that. Okay, well, the burning bush is at Mount Sinai. Then in Arabia, then they had to come. And of course, they knew it was in the land of Midian, so then they had to come back to that spot. Well, they knew it in Palestine too, because they're here talking about it, right? So, and this yeah. is not just the leaders. You know, the, the yeah. apostles knew about it. Stand in front sure. of the leaders of Israel who were teaching the law every Sabbath, and it says in another plot that they don't believe it. In fact, uh, that's in Acts chapter 13. They don't right. believe Just it. Just as today, our pastors, the vast majority of Judeo-Christian pastors, don't really believe it. They reject the whole Testament. Your scholars don't believe it because they don't know where Mount Sinai is. Once you put Sinai, look, people don't understand this. You got to understand this. If you put Mount Sinai in the wrong country, all the Bible's wrong. You can't make the Bible correct because every place that's listed, there's a whole bunch of things that revolve around where Mount Sinai is. Once you move Mount Sinai to the wrong country, there's no way you can believe the Bible because none of the evidence of the things in the Bible make any sense when you're in the wrong spot. That's right. You have to know the history. Right. <laughs> you got to know the location. Mm -hmm. They know the history, but they don't. Ha they don't know where it happened. They don't know where all these things happened because they got Mount Sinai in the wrong country. Once yeah. they know where Mount Sinai is, then you can go see. Oh, it's well. It's, of course, they've got the evidence there if they went and looked. But no one right. could get in Saudi Arabia. That's the problem. So very few people right. have come from Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai with evidence. You see. 
Right, exactly, exactly. Got it now, but, you know, years ago we didn't have it. Okay, so we see that Peter, Stephen, Paul, James, they're all in agreement that there were many Israelites among them who were unbelievers, and that was the problem. There were too many Israelites of our people who were unbelievers and refused to follow the law, and therefore they had no faith in Christ. Yeah, and their posterity were, uh, you know, that's the whole idea of blessings and curses. Even their posterity, if they kept doing what their fathers did and rejecting Christ, right. then, then you know. But here's, here's one thing that I did explain that most people probably haven't thought of. Even the ones, the Israelites that rejected Christ, he had to keep them alive. Right. He had to keep the posterity so, but, alive. And why did he have to do that? Why didn't he just kill all of them? Think about this for a second. Why didn't he just kill all of them? Why did he have to keep them alive? I smite you. <laughs> no, think about it. He said 40 years in the desert. He killed their fathers. Right. He kept the sons. But he had to. Right. Because he had to have this... Uh, you know, to get all the way up here to the New Testament, all this stuff was prophecy. Everything that happened in the New Testament was prophecy right. from the Old Testament. So, yeah. You know, and I said, and these other prophets, the point is, for these prophecies to come true, he had to have these other people who would kill him. Christ had to die, right. and he had to die from the people that were right. supposed to kill him from prophecy from the Old Testament. So he couldn't kill them. Even though they were rejecting him, he couldn't kill them. He had to, he had to keep this posterity going because right. they had a job to do in the New Testament, which was to kill him. Now think right. about it. Right. What yeah. if Caiaphas, and I made this point, Caiaphas understood the prophecy. If you go back to what it says about Caiaphas, he understood. He said that this, uh, don't, what did he say, uh, where is that, in Acts uh, 13, he said, don't you understand that uh, one man has to die so that all the tribes will come together? Right. All the nations will come together. What he's talking about is that all 12 tribes will come together because that's the prophecies. Right. Chapter, uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, 31, 32, and 33. All three of those have the exact same thing. Right. All yeah, twelve but, tribes come together under Christ. Right. Yeah, but Caiaphas had an ulterior motive because no, I, I think <laughs> what it was was he understood it. But here, here's the problem: yeah, they want to, to stay yeah. in charge of things, and if they allow that to to uh, you know, if they didn't kill Christ, well, first of all, he was right. If they didn't kill Christ, then these prophecies wouldn't come true. So they had to do that to bring all twelve tribes together. So it's a paradox: they have to kill Christ, mm -hmm. even though they. Christ, they still have to kill Christ, otherwise the prophecies of the Old Testament won't come true, so they're stuck in a paradox. That's if they kill him, then they can stay in charge. <laughs> it's the same way you've got the federal government staying in charge today. They keep themselves in charge by doing whatever they have to do, well, just so they can keep themselves in authority, but if they were to allow us to go back to the Constitution, then they would be kicked out for their crimes, you see. That's right, right. Well, I mean, the same thing applies to Judas. He say, I have chosen you 12, and one of you is a devil. Yeah, they have to They have to have the people who reject Christ in the New Testament so that's all right. the prophets will come through. So they can't just kill them off. I know, I know it's a paradox, but that's just the thing. But Caiaphas understood. He actually, that's what his statement was about. If he doesn't kill Christ, all 12 tribes won't come together in the future. Now, he didn't know necessarily. The, and here's the other problem. Now, here's the logical reason. And I know I've told you this before and some other people, but here's the logical reason that you would reject Christ if you knew Scripture. Christ came. He explained to people prophecy. Right. But he explained to them uh, some prophecy about the first coming, most of the prophecy he was talking about was actually the second coming. However, if you, all you've got is the Old Testament and you're reading through all this Old Testament prophecy, there's no way you can look at that stuff and see where Christ is going to come once, he's going to die, then he's going to come back right. a hundred years later, a thousand years later, two thousand, it doesn't matter. He, there's no way to look at it and say, okay, he's going to die here, and he's going to come back yeah. 2,000 years later. It's impossible. Right, and they didn't, people didn't have the time, and most of the Israelites did not have a written version of the Old Testament before them. I'm yeah. talking about the fact that Caiaphas understood the prophecy, but right. even though he 
understood the prophecy, he could not have told you that Christ was going to come back 2,000 years later because that's right. not there. That's All you have are prophecies about Christ coming, Christ doing this, Christ doing that. What they wanted Christ prophecy. to fulfill right. was the second coming. The prophecies of the second coming is what they were looking for Christ to fulfill. Christ could not fulfill that. He yeah. told them the prophecy. Yeah, he not at that time. Back. Right. Exactly. However, if Christ does not fulfill the prophecy, then he's not Christ. All right. Uh, uh, you, you could say that. <laughs> no, that's what they were saying. Jesus, yes. You're not fulfilling the prophecies. That's why you're not Christ. That's the logical reason for killing him, because he's claiming to be Christ, but he's not fulfilling the prophecies that he told them he was going to do when he came. But they don't know that he's going to come, die, and come back. 2,000 years later, because that's not in there. It, yeah, and, and judge them. Yeah, you have to read the both Testaments. <laughs> you have to be aware of the even two second, both this, Even that doesn't do it. You can't read the second come, you know, all these prophecies of the second coming. You cannot read that and say, oh, okay, here's the differentiation. Here's the first coming, and then here he's going to leave for 2,000 years, and then here's where he's going to come back. It's not there. That's no. what I'm telling you. When you read it, it's all one prophecy. It's not, you know, multiple prophecies that all happen at the same time. Right. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not, not explicit. No 2,000 year break in those prophecies of the Old Testament. Okay. It's not there, and they could not. They did not know that. Right. Right. Okay. All right. So we have a lot of people said, "Is the kingdom of God going to commence now?" They didn't know it was going to be 2,000 years. Yeah, that's why they asked. They said, no, uh, yeah, uh, not yet. <laughs> not yet, okay? For you to know so, the time, right. So yeah. it's not there. It's just simply not there. So he's explained that he's going to come back. He did not tell them how far it was going to be. They did right. not know. We don't. We didn't know it until basically now that, you know, it's 2,000 exactly. years. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's the prophecy in the book of Daniel. Seal up the book. Until the, the time is ready, nobody really understood the Book of Daniel until the 20th century. Because you have yeah. to you know, look at all the past history, all the f fulfillment of the prophecies in the Book of Daniel before you could understand it. All right, but okay. that's their legitimate reason for killing Christ because okay. he did not fulfill the prophecies that he gave them. Right, he but there, yeah, but uh, in John, I believe it's chapter 10, where he talks to the Israelites. That uh, you know, I am the vine, you are the branches, and he's clearly talking to Israelites there. Uh, but some of you will be resurrected unto damnation, and others of you will be resurrected unto eternal life. So he's talking to Israelites, uh, you know, the, yeah. the, 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 the errors that a lot of people in Christian identity make is they assume that whenever he's castigating somebody, uh. He's talking about Jews. No, he's talking about his kinsmen, the unbelieving Israelites. Right. So after 70 AD, people could call them whatever they wanted, and they didn't even have to be of Israel at all. They could just call themselves a Jew. Sammy Davis Jr. was a Jew, but that doesn't make him an Israelite. So the point was, after the fact, all I'm focusing on is what Scripture says. So what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is, I call it Christian Israel versus Jewish Israel. And the reason I do that is because I'm just sticking with the scripture, none of the history after the fact, but there is putting context in what you're right. reading. Right. And that you can, no pastor, every pastor, let's put it this way, every pastor that teaches the New Testament teaches that there were Christian Israelites. All right. I mean, they all teach that. All they're doing is saying, oh, these guys are gone. The ones that Christ chose would have been the Christian Israelites, not the ones that rejected them, not the ones that stumbled over the stumbling stone. It's logical. You see? Yeah. That he would have chose the ones that, that, that chose him. Those were the chosen, the one that accepted, the, and it was prophecy. Okay, so they're, they're, it's all prophecy, starting from Abraham. We just read it. So they accepted the prophecies. They accepted him as the fulfillment of the prophecies, even though he's not fulfilling the second coming. And then in Luke 24, 44, that's where you see that he's, Christ is teaching the apostles of the second coming. They didn't know the second coming up till then. 
Right. That's when he's going back and he says, I'm going back to Moses, the prophets, and Psalms and teaching you all these prophecies, and that's where these quotes come from. These quotes are things that Christ taught the apostles. That's why they're here in quotes. You need to know all these quotes. You need to learn this. This is yeah. what Christ yeah, this they don't is study the scriptures. <laughs> they don't study the scriptures. Yeah. We can, we can put a timeline to this. Forty days he taught prophecy. 40 days. How many hours of that? Well, I say, well, five hours a day, that's approximately 200 hours. So Christ taught prophecy for approximately 200 hours of mostly the second coming, which is the quotes that you're reading in the New Testament. It's 300 quotes, and I've got them on these two charts. Okay, very good. Now, where these same Judeo-Christian pastors go wrong is they falsely assume that the word Gentiles is a reference to non-Israelites. Yeah, but when you go back to the quote, here's what really wraps it, and I'll highlight it here for you. But what I showed was this part in Isaiah from, uh, if you want to put the quote from Isaiah 42.1, it goes to uh, Matthew twelve twenty one, Luke two thirty two, which is the most important, in Acts thirteen forty seven about Gentiles. Okay, and that quotes uh, Isaiah forty two one through six. Well, if you want to put that in in context, how do you do that? Well, if you just look at my chart, you'll see. Well, there's quotes. Now, if you uh, are good with Isaiah, you realize most of this kind of starts here at chapter forty. So if we start at chapter 40 and go up to, say, 44 and look at all these quotes into that section of Isaiah, that's how you would put it into context. Right. And so, oddly enough, Luke 2.32, the quote on Gentiles, Luke, is the one that really does it for you. Because Luke chapter 1, I went all through that and showed you that's Gabriel. That's Gabriel, an angel, talking to Zacharias, and then that's Gabriel the angel talking to Mary, mm -hmm. you see, and then Zacharias, after that, comes back, and you read that section, it's talking about Israel people. It's not talking about, and it's using the word Gentiles. Right, exactly. Okay. That's a false it use. It absolutely yeah. tells you this is all prophecy about Christ coming to Israel. Christ born. He's being born, which I said was, uh, you know, uh, Isaiah 7, 14. So he's being born. All this stuff they're talking about right there in the first chapter of Luke absolutely makes a point that uh, Christ is the light coming to Israel people as prophecy. And that prophecy is was given to Zacharias by Gabriel and is given to Mary. What she's repeating was given to her by Gabriel, an angel. Right, right. Right. Well, see, now here's where uh, the Judeo pastors go wrong. They assume because the quote unquote Jews rejected Christ, even though they don't admit that they actually killed him too, right? That, that somehow the prophecies of the Old Testament were stopped at those Jews and now are generalized to the whole planet. Well, where do you get the justification for that? It's well, because of the false hits of the, the Christian time. Israelites. I can't find the Christian Israelites, even though where is your history? Now, think about this logically. Think about this logic. They they kept the Jews that rejected Christ. They right. still call them Jews. They, whether they're even Israelites or not, it doesn't matter. They kept they held on to that part. Right. The Jews that rejected Christ, which are not chosen, they held on to them, and they right. still say, oh, these are these people that, yeah. that call They're themselves Jews. Israel, right? <laughs> yeah. They dropped the, the Israelites that believed in Christ, they dropped them, and then they say, oh, we don't know who they are. Right. Yeah, okay. because we are them. That's the problem. They don't even know that they are them, right? But so, the history. How did the, this message of Christ get from the time Christ died to today? Where's our history? Well, we only have one history. We don't have a history of two different groups of people creating Bibles, of two different people going through the world. Uh, you know, some Israelite, it must have been some, right? Where are the Israelite Christian Israel people from right. the time of Christ to today, well, we lost those, but then somehow we picked up these other people that we don't even know where these white people came from. Right. But they're the ones that print the Bibles, and they're the ones that's taken the, the message, and they're the ones that's being killed. Right. That makes sense. There's no logic. Zero logic. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Uh, Captain Witness says, quoting scripture is like kryptonite for, for Judeo-Christians. <laughs> they, they yeah, th these 
it's really obvious, but they forgot. They're still uh, in the dark about the scattered tribes, that the 12 tribes. And uh, remember, it's, not, it's, it's brainwashing. What they have is people that <laughs> infiltrate their church, and they're lying. You know, the Communist Party said way back, all the way back in the early 1900s, they said the way to take over America is to take over the church. So we're going to infiltrate the church. That was what the Communist Party said way back in like 1910 or whatever that was. They said that's what they were going to do. That's what they did. I know these guys small, nice. They talk good. They're educated. They have doctorates. But they're lying. That's right. That's right. And the average Christian doesn't know that the church has been infiltrated by these communists, uh, and secularists, atheists, Satanists, etc. They don't know history. Now, here, this is brainwashing now. Now, once you get all these liars into your church saying the same thing over and over and over, then that's brainwashing. And that's what the, every time you turn your TV on, that's all that's on TV is brainwashing. <clears throat> they repeat the stuff about viruses. But we know that viruses can be healed with ozone because Dr. Rowan healed Ebola. He had it on his website. They made him take his website down. The website he has now is a new website. He had an older website. They had the information of how he healed Ebola with uh, ozone, how all that went away. That was never reported on the news. They quit reporting about Sierra Leone. Oh, all that was handled. But they didn't tell you that, oh, that virus was healed by using ozone. And by the way, you can buy an ozone machine and treat yourself and heal yourself of Ebola. What news agency has ever told you that? None. 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 Not Not one. All news. It's brainwashing. And all that's run by the intelligence agencies that sit up in D.C. and Virginia and all that. It's all run by them. Right, right. Okay. Well, with about 10 minutes left, uh, what uh, what verse do you want to cover next? Well, to- what I'd like to say is, look, okay. forget talking about more of this. What we need now is for people to learn this. So these five videos uh, were – well, the first one, for example – uh, that we're, we're talking about, uh, Christian Israel versus Jewish Israel. Everybody that knows that, that sees this needs to understand it. So you're going to have to read it a few times, look at the videos a few times. It's not a, it's not a no brainer. You're going to have to read it, do a little study, but all the important connections, the important logical connections that you can use to argue your point successfully with anybody, even if they have a doctorate or a PhD, if you learn this, you can argue with anybody on earth that you're right, they're wrong. But you got to learn it. So here's your study guide. Here's all the information you need, and you just watch this. Look, I've read Revelation 300 times, the whole book. I was 20 times reading that book before I even got the basics. Right. I was 20 times reading Revelation before I could just connect the dots in my head. It was 20 times. I've read it 300 times. I've read Isaiah all the way in the end at least 20 times, and parts of it I've read hundreds Right. So I just don't get it. You got to commit yourself. But if you commit yourself and you pray about it, Christ will well, you, give you all right. this. <laughs> and you'll be better than the next guy. In other words, you'll know something. Uh, you know, Eli knows something. I know something. The next teacher knows something. And what I know might be a little unique. And what the next guy knows is a little unique. You know more history. Yeah. I know less yeah, history. Together. This, this, this. However, you got- all together. Yeah, that's what this is about. Yeah. Information, and we're all going to work together to bring the message out. But here's the main connections for Gentiles and the main thing you need to know about Christ, why Christ is the shield. I've already got that on my website. You right. are gods, and some of those I did with Paul. Actually, the, some of the best stuff we did showing mm-hmm. you this power with God. The word Israel means power with God. Where did that start? That started with the vision of the ladder to heaven. When Israel, when uh, Jacob had his name changed, it was changed by an angel. That was Yehoah or Christ. And the reason we know that is because the angel, it started out, if you read that, it said a man. He met a man. But then it says it was an angel. So the an angel, and then at the end of the conversation, the angel says, I am the God of the house of God. And the house of God was the stone, which we call Jacob's pillar stone, that he had laid his head on the night 
at this place called, uh, it was Adam Luz. That's what it says in my prayer, Adam Luz. That was at Sinai. Uh-huh. He saw, that's with the mountain of God. That's where he saw the vision right. to the ladder of heaven was at Sinai. At yeah. this place so, called Luz. Right. Abraham was there. Jacob was there. They had kind of crisscrossed that territory between Egypt and uh, what was a uh, Mesopotamia. Right. Here's the, thing, here's the thing. Now, if you go over there to Arabia, there's a sign that says Mount Laws, L-A-W-Z. Okay. And that up, you'll see that that was L-U-Z, L-U-U-Z, L-A-W-Z. It's spelled multiple ways. L-O-O-S or L-O-O-Z is one spelling I found. If you look up maps, yeah, okay, right. You'll see. Well, it's called different things. It depends on whether it was the French writing the map or whether it was the Germans writing the map or who was writing the map, drawing right. the map, is how they spelled it. Okay. It was yeah. L-U-Z originally, and then it became some of these other spellings. Now we call it L-A-W-Z, which if you look on Google, it's called the Mountain of Almonds. That's how we you, you do it in English. Okay. But that's the Mountain of God. Right. And that's where Jacob laid his head, he saw the vision, and then he took a rock, and there's plenty of rocks, so take your pick. <laughs> but then he carried that rock with him through the desert. Right. It talks about this water. So they went down through Arabia, they were still car- and they brought this rock out of Egypt. They had the rock in Egypt. They had to have it in Egypt because they had it as soon as they got on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba, they had the rock. Right. However, when they came to Mount Sinai is when they split the rock. That's the rock of Orb. Now, if you do your research on Christ the rock in 1 Corinthians uh, 10.4, and you start following up those cross-references, you'll see that brings you back to the rock of Orb, which is the big rock, and you'll that's pretty amazing. You'll see that in the videos. It's still there. Yeah. It's still there, but it's a huge rock, 70 feet high, and it's already 100 feet up on a plateau. So. Right. Other rocks, let's put it that way. Uh, but at any rate, uh, so some, however, some. they didn't carry that rock with them into uh, Arabia. When they went south, they went all the way, probably all the way down to Yemen, which is where Sheba was from right. down there. Yemen. Yeah, they carried a rock with them and got a stream of water. That's the rock that Moses struck twice. It was not the rock of Oreb that Moses struck twice. It was the the small rock that they were carrying, which is Jacob's pillar stone. They also got water from that. Yes. And that's the spirit. That's why they call it the house of God. When they were carrying that rock around with them, they were carrying around the spirit okay. of Jehovah. They tap it with uh, the rod, the almond rod, which came from the same area, Mount, Mount Sinai. That's where he broke that rod off. And there is still almond trees there to the day. There's still quail that lands there coming across the, Aqua, the Gulf of Aqua. Right. Okay. There's still the burning bush, and there's still fig trees there. Fig trees. Okay. Yeah. It's still there. It's all there. Right. Only at Sinai, though. It doesn't grow anywhere else, but it grows there. No Sinai. Right. Not not the fake Sinai that, that the Judeo oh, no. scholars. And yeah. Arabia. That's the only place that stuff grows. Right. Okay. You don't have cedar trees in Arabia. <laughs> right. you, don't, yeah. you don't have cedar trees. But this is a huge tree. I mean, huge. So, yes, they've looked at it and said, yeah, it's probably 3,500 years old or older. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, but very they don't in Arabia. You don't grow cedar in the desert. No. No, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> the but cedars of that. Lebanon, the Lebanon is a mountainous territory, kind of like California, right, yeah. where uh, these types of trees grow in, in abundance. Right. So actually, the Saudis have done us a service by uh, the fact that after Ron Wyatt, they went and they fenced all this stuff in, and they've right. been protecting it. Now they're building a city there, and I'm sure they'll still protect it because they want people to come, so they don't right. want people tearing this stuff up. They don't want people carving their name into the burning bush. I mean, that'd probably get you killed, <laughs> you right. know, if they're carving their name in. They're not going to let you do that. So right. they're going to they're gonna protect it. So I'm not sure. that worried about it. But this is all Yahweh working his magic, right? He's using the Saudis to preserve that site. There you go. And that's what he does. That's what that's what power with God means. That means that he does things for the Israel people. And, you you know, he does it. You don't even have to. I mean, you just, all you have to do, your end of it is doing what he told you to do. 
Follow his law, teach it to your children, teach it to your kindred. That's what the kingdom of God message is. That's why he taught. Take it to your kindred. Right, yeah. I wish he would do things my way once in a while. <laughs> so, you know, this is right, so, so simple, Eli. That's all there is to it. Right? Well, yeah. Believe, so, the so way he said, believe in me, teach your children, teach your kindred. Right. That's all right. it is. And don't make up fairy tales that aren't in the Bible. That's, but that's no, what all people scholars are in these days. You can't have a big church and take the key message. You're only going to have a few people. So that's why the pastors change the message because they want to be known by a lot more people that, you know, they're great right. people. and yeah, They're materialists. Right. They, they want to be worshipped by the, the congregation. They don't care about the law and the word. But here, let me just kind of quickly summarize, you know, because we've been coming, uh, I and my ministry have been coming at the subject of the Gentiles by simply analyzing the, the words, you know, goy, for yeah, sure. sometimes yeah. it's translated nation, sometimes it's translated Gentile. And well, that's nation. When it's used in the same sentence and says Gentiles and this says nations, that should be a yeah. clue to somebody that, oh, this means the same thing. That's right. It doesn't mean non-Israelites because the same word is used to describe Israelites, goy, as Gentiles. Okay? Right. So what, you know, what don't you understand? Well, yeah. because we have been taught falsely that the word Gentile means non-Israelites, that everybody believes it because that's what they've been taught. And then these videos are just all your quotes and cross-references to prove the point, but you're going to have to do some study. I mean, you know. Right. So uh, your approach is to do these cross-references to prove the point. Yeah. Okay. So context. It works oh, context. Text. If you yeah. can show people context and you can prove your context, they cannot argue. That's right. They can, the the words, they can deny it. They can't argue. Yeah, and between the word studies and the cross-references, you cannot go wrong. But nobody bothers to do that except us in Christian Israel. Listen, I'm not a pastor, so uh, someone could take this, well, I would hope, is someone like yourself or others, somebody who's a good speaker, I'm not a good speaker, but someone could take this and put it together and make sense where they could actually teach it and the congregation at large could understand it. That would be great because I can't really do that. But the information's there and people right. could learn themselves and argue with anybody. And that was what I'm trying to accomplish. Yeah. Abraham says that Jacob and Esau were just two, two goys. <laughs> <laughs> Two guys, right? So, all right. So, the the essence of the teaching is all in line with Christian identity, that the Bible is the covenant between Yahweh and His children Israel, and these covenants cannot be generalized to the quote unquote Gentiles. But the Bible doesn't say it will be generalized to the quote unquote Gentiles. He never says anything like that. It's the uh, the Judeo Christian ministry that has distorted the word by using the word Gentile in a false sense. Yeah, and the only thing I'm saying about Christian Israel is that look, all pastors teach Christian Israel because all of them teach that the first believers in Christ were Israelites. That's right. Although so they that's Christian it, Israel yeah. right there. Every pastor teaches it. You don't have to change anything or, or whatever. It's They right. already teach that. All they teach is that those Christian Israelites is that we don't know who they were, even yeah. though it was the Christians that were chosen and the Jews that were rejected. And they don't know that they're even the posterity of those same Israelites because right. they falsely believe the Jews are. Right? If they do know, they lie, and because they that message won't get them anywhere, and they won't get them a big church to teach in, and the only place they'll be regulated is the base of the internet or stand on a street corner. Amen, amen. All right, all right Brother David, thanks. Uh, it's been a very enlightening show today. Uh, maybe we can do another installment of this, but I think uh, you know people go to your website and learn for themselves, they'll understand. All right? Yeah, thanks, if they, we, look, if they want to, if y'all want to, uh, if some of your people come up and say, well, let's look at, you you know, why don't y'all do about this or that? We can go over something else. It's no big deal. Yeah, yeah very good. Okay, thanks, David. Uh, we're run out of time. Thanks a lot. Right. Take Thank care. You. All right, bye-bye.